Baptist Church. I am Pastor Mark. Today we invite you to come and worship the Lord with us. Psalm 67 verse 3 and 4 says, Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the people with such equity and guide the nations up on earth. Let us join our hearts together in worshiping the Lord this morning. Amen. hear the word of the Lord that is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 6 through 7. For this reason I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you a spirit of fear but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. One of my family's favorite movies is The Day After Tomorrow. We have probably watched this movie at least a dozen times and have probably watched clips of the movie probably three times that number. We are enthralled with the action. We love the what ifs. In fact, we often go to bed thinking about what would it be like to live in a world that is like that. 
For those that have never seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow, Dennis Quaid plays a paleoclimatologist, someone who studies the past climates to get an idea of what the climate will look like in today's world. In the movie, he makes a prediction that the world is going to self-correct by entering into a new ice age. The movie itself centers around what would happen if a new ice age happened upon the earth. Throughout the movie, you notice individuals trying to deal with the chaos as people are evacuated from the towns and the cities that lie up above a certain line in America. There is many economic factions that will play out during this time, and Dennis Quaid has to make his a trek all the way from Washington, D.C. to New York to save his son, who has gotten trapped behind that line of evacuation. At the end of the movie, there is a scene that basically shows the new ice age has begun, and the world is something brand new. Our current situation feels similar to this movie. We could basically replace this climate change with the coronavirus. And we look and we both ask questions about what did we know beforehand? What do we need to do now? And what will life look like after this is over? Both circumstances, both the movie and the coronavirus today have one thing that stands out and it is that they show how reactive humanity is. In the movie scientists predict what would happen if the climate ran out of control but the powers do not listen. When the climate suddenly does run out of control all the powers can do is really react. They are reacting because they don't understand what is going on and they have no idea about what to do. With the coronavirus, it feels sometimes that we face that similar situation. There were predictions about the virus even going back to last year. A Kansas City professor even made a prediction about uh, viruses happening. But pandemics are a part of humanity's history. We can expect that this is a virus for this time, but it won't be the last virus that we will ever experience. But for most of us here, this is the first pandemic that we have ever experienced. Thankfully, most of our medical professionals know a lot more than they did 50 or 60 years ago when they have been contemplating what we need to do in response to a pandemic. But for most of us, most of us, we do not know what to do. We know to wash our hands, we know to keep our social distance, and we know to stay at home, but that's basically it for the rest of us. Even if we look beyond the, the scientific part of this, we are left with a lot of questions. What will our economic future be after the corona quarantine is over? What will the health issues be as we look out into the future as well? We have no plans for the lifestyle changes that will occur because of what has happened. And we don't even know what our community changes will face. Uh, just this week I read an article by Ryan Barge who asked the question, will COVID-19 lead to a long-term shift in church attendance? And the question I ask, is the church ready for this? Are we ready to address a possible attendance issue. And if the past few decades are an indication, then I have to say the answer is no. Like the movie, we are waking up to a new world. A world that we don't really know what it's going to be like. And while we would like to have a thoughtful response, it seems as though all that we can do is react. Now I don't offer this analysis this morning, however flawed it is, to point fingers at anyone in power. I'm not a politician, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an economist, I'm a simple pastor. And the reality is these are questions for individuals that have the knowledge to understand what to do. I offer this analysis so that we can take a look at human nature. Because in the movie we see reactivity. 
And currently with the virus, we see reactivity. And it seems as human beings, we tend to react a lot more than we respond. If we look, we see it all around us, whether it be the coronavirus, climate change, politics, morality, our families, our work. In fact, within the church, we could almost say that the vast majority of sin is reactive in nature. Our reactivity is a big part of our lives. Let me clarify what I mean. A healthy response, notice that word response, not react, gives us time of pause between a stimulus, whether it's external to us or whether it's internal within us, and our responding action. It gives us time to consider the evidence, the experts, our experience, and other pertinent information it allows us time to pause and gather our emotions and think through what we want to say and do. This is a healthy and mature way of living. An unhealthy re react reaction gives us no pause between a stimulus, whether it be external or internal, to our responding action. We basically move from one event to the next event. We don't consider any pertinent information. We don't consider our own experience or even our emotions. All that we do is react. Truth sadly becomes something to be dismissed or derided. Our reactivity is often very emotional in our way of life and it is immature and unhelpful and unhealthy. There are times in our lives in which that we do have to react. That is a part of our lives. We cannot deny this. Policemen and firemen and emergency individuals are constantly having to react. But when we look at our lives, this should be the exception, not the rule. And even when we do have to react, we should be prepared for our reaction. If you look at policemen and firemen and emergency individuals and those who Re jobs require them to react, they are very prepared for their reaction. Sadly, the vast majority of us, we simply react and that is the way that our lives go. Think about the ways that we react. Someone pushes your button and instead of thoughtfully considering a, reaction, a response to them, we react and basically say an unkind word, we become passive aggressive or we could just become outright aggressive. A thought passes through our mind and instead of thinking that thought through and deciding whether we need to act upon it or not, we react and say what that thought is to whoever is around us. We want to please people. We want to make them happy. We want them to like us. But instead of considering whether or not we need to please them or whether we need to be truthful in our love with them, we allow ourselves to be treated like garbage and maybe even other people get treated like garbage in the process. We think that something must be done now or it must be done perfect so we push ourselves or we push other people never stopping to consider whether it does have to be done now or can be done in a less than perfect way. Someone tells us a juicy piece of gossip and instead of pausing to reflect whether it's true or not, we run to the phone and pick up the phone and begin to call someone. Does any of this hit home? This list could easily continue because reactivity is so much a part of us and it always has been. When we go to scripture, we can go to the very beginning and we see the reactivity that is a part of humanity. Consider Adam and Eve. Eve is tempted by the snake, but never once do we see a pause in her reactivity to the serpent. And likewise, when Adam is asked by Eve to eat of the fruit, once again, he doesn't pause either. Consider Cain and Abel. Cain, when his offering is not took by God, but Abel's is approved by God, we see this reactivity of Cain and anger towards Abel. 
And instead of thoughtfully responding, Cain murders Abel. Consider the drunkenness of Noah and his response to Ham and his grandson Canaan. Consider Abraham's fears and what he did with both Pharaoh and Sarah in his reaction to them. Consider Moses' anger when he saw his fellow Israelites subjected to slavery against the Israelites, against the Egyptians. Consider David as he's there on the rooftop and he looks down and he sees Bathsheba bathing. He could have easily looked away, but instead he doesn't. A simple reaction. How many of us really sympathize with Peter whenever Jesus is confronted by the guards in the garden and Peter reacts by cutting off someone's ears? And how many of us want to pull out a sword and do likewise? Scripture paints this full picture of humanity, but at the same time, it shows us that we are very reactive. Now, Scripture doesn't necessarily call it either a response or a reactivity. Instead, it puts the words together with one word, and that is self-control. And self-control definitely speaks of our ability to pause between a stimulus that is either external or internal to us or and our response to that. And Scripture is adamant that self-control is a basic part of our faith. Consider Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, when it says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Or 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, when it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And then one of the most interesting is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, which says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I find this last one interesting because all of the other fruit, or at least the vast majority, are dependent upon self-control. You cannot be patient or kind or faithful or gentle if you are not self-controlled. The writer of 2 Timothy picks up on this idea of self-control when he writes, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. The writer contrasts two very different spirits, and one is God-given and the other is within us. The first is fear. It is within us. Fear is almost always at the basis of our reactivity. Fear keeps us from speaking the truth in love. It keeps us from thinking the best about people. It causes us to push people away. Fear is powerful. And it is this fear that causes us to be reactive. Maybe that's why scripture repeatedly says, do not be fearful. The other spirit that the author describes is one of power and of love and of self-control. These three elements walk hand in hand. You, you cannot have one without the other. For you see, power without self-control is bullying and manipulation. And love without power and self-control is abusive to oneself, while self-control without power is impossible and self-control without love is pride. But these three elements come together and paint a picture of what it means to be a mature and healthy Christian as we respond to the stimulus around us. Think about this. A healthy, mature Christian's response to life is always filled with the power of God, motivated by the love of God for one another, and striving to keep the flesh under control. As healthy, mature Christians, we move from being reactive to being responsive. For it is there that we discover that we cannot love other people and have a knee-jerk reaction to their faults. We discover that we cannot be filled with the power of God and avoid certain people. And we find out that we cannot dominate other people 
and be calm in acting of love. In fact, we cannot do the vast majority of our reactive reactivity while being mature Christians. This season of Lent has been an invitation to pause. And Lent, in and of itself, invites us to look at our self-control, to look at our reactivity and our response that we often have. It's not to cause us to look with shame or fear. It's caused us to look with honesty and hope, to know that God is working within us and helping us to understand why we are the way that we are. We look at what pushes our buttons. We look at why we react and we confess. We confess our unhealthiness, our immaturity, our unhealthy ways and our lack of self-control. For it is here that we discover that God is inviting us to receive a gift. A gift of power and of love and of self-control. It is not our discipline that will help us to become less reactive. It is the hand of God. The hand of God that moves in our lives to help us to become more mature and more healthy. So as we finish this season of Lent, I invite you to receive the Spirit of God so that you might be responsive and live abundantly in this world. Amen. During the coronavirus quarantine, one activity we have missed is joining one another in worship. Easter Sunday is a day we especially join together in giving witness to Christ's resurrection. 
Therefore, Grove United Methodist Church is planning a drive-in style worship service so we can join one another in giving witness to Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. We will meet in our back parking lot at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday morning. You are invited to worship from the comfort and safety of your own car. And we invite you to bring, uh, invite your family and friends to come and join us in their cars as well. So please plan to join us as we give witness to Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. Amen. <music> 